Imagine waking up and learning that one of the most dangerous things for spacecraft is not a hacker, not a thunderstorm, and not even a meteorite. It is a silent ring that wraps around Earth, glows in no color we can see, and quietly damages electronics. It does not care about brand names or warranties. It never sleeps. It hovers above your head right now. If you could look up and spot it, it would appear like a faint torus of invisible fire. This is the radiation belt, sometimes called the Van Allen belts. Engineers often call it something less polite. In this script, we will explore why Earth has an invisible ring of death, why almost no one talks about it, and why your GPS, your internet satellites, and every weather forecast rely on surviving of its punishment. The sun is not gentle. It constantly releases a wind of charged particles, mostly protons and electrons, racing outward at hundreds of kilometers per second. Earth, for all its beauty, is a giant magnet. That magnetic field creates a bubble in the solar wind called the magnetosphere. Most of the time, this bubble shields us, bending the solar wind away like a rock parting water. But some particles get caught. They spiral along magnetic field lines, bounce between the poles, and drift in circles around Earth. If you could paint each particle with glowing paint, you would see two great donuts of trapped radiation encircling the planet. That is the ring. We only discovered it in 1958, when Explorer 1, the first American satellite, carried a Geiger counter. The detector maxed out so often that the scientists thought it was broken. It was not. It was registering radiation far more intense than anyone imagined. James Van Allen's name became attached to the belts. And from then on, every spacecraft design had to consider them. They were not thin or harmless. They were vast, energetic, and deadly to fragile electronics. There are two primary belts. The inner belt sits a few thousand kilometers above Earth and is dominated by very energetic protons. These protons arise from a process called cosmic ray albedo neutron decay. Cosmic rays strike the upper atmosphere, creating showers of particles. Some of those particles decay into protons that are trapped by the magnetic field. The result is a region thick with high energy protons, capable of rearranging atoms inside materials. The outer belt sits further out and is dominated by electrons, some moving so fast they are called relativistic. These killer electrons can burrow into spacecraft surfaces, build up charge, and then discharge as small lightning bolts inside wiring insulation. The damage is often catastrophic. Between the belts lies a calmer slot region. This zone exists because electromagnetic waves scatter particles out of orbit and down into the atmosphere. Earth itself, with its lightning and natural radio noise, helps clear this gap. Many navigation satellites, such as GPS, occupy orbits within this slot. But the slot is not permanent. During powerful solar storms, the outer belt swells inward, filling the region with fresh radiation. A safe orbit one week can become hostile the next. Operators of satellites in these zones keep constant watch on space weather reports. These belts matter because they can destroy hardware. When a charged particle hits a microchip, it may flip a digital bit, turning a zero into a one. Engineers call this a single event upset. Your phone never notices because Earth's thick atmosphere blocks most of the radiation. But satellites have no such protection. Their computers experience constant bit flips and they must use error correcting memory to detect and repair them. Sometimes the energy is so high that it burns a permanent defect into the silicon, locking circuits until they short out. Solar panels degrade as radiation displaces atoms from their crystal lattice. Detectors fill with static. Star trackers lose their view of the stars. Batteries wear out early. If you care about mission lifetime, you care about this ring. Every subsystem is vulnerable in its own way. Radiation darkens solar panels and can strip away 20 to 30% of their efficiency over a mission lifetime. It causes sensors 
especially optical cameras, to accumulate hot pixels that create permanent noise. Batteries age prematurely, losing capacity as ions migrate into defects created by proton bombardment. Communication systems suffer when charging causes mini arcs that detune antennas. Even simple relays and switches can weld shut. The ring has no preference. It eats at every part of a machine. Humans are not immune either. Inside the inner belt, doses can rise to dangerous levels quickly. The Apollo astronauts crossed the belts on their way to the moon, but they passed through rapidly and stayed in regions where the flux was lower. Their spacecraft provided aluminum shielding, and their total exposure was well within safe limits. But parking a person inside the belts for days would be risky. Radiation sickness would be a real possibility, along with long-term cancer risks. The belts are not a place for permanent habitation. They form a moat around our world. A low-altitude reminder of this hazard is the South Atlantic Anomaly. Earth's magnetic field is slightly offset from the planet's center, and it tilts. Over the South Atlantic Ocean, the inner belt dips closer to the surface. Satellites passing through this region experience spikes in radiation. The International Space Station orbits below the main belts, but still grazes this anomaly. Astronauts report electronics crashing, cameras glitching, and higher radiation readings when flying through this zone. Some even say they see brief flashes of light in their vision when high-energy particles strike their retinas. Experiments often shut down during passes to avoid corrupted data. The anomaly itself shifts over time as Earth's magnetic field evolves. Solar storms make the belts even more volatile. When the sun hurls a coronal mass ejection, the impact compresses Earth's magnetosphere and pumps fresh energy into the belts. Waves ripple along magnetic field lines, sometimes scattering particles out of orbit, sometimes accelerating them to higher energies. The outer belt in particular can swell rapidly, with electron flux increasing by orders of magnitude. Engineers design satellites with safety margins, shielding, and hardened components precisely for these storm events. They also create safe mode software that shuts down sensitive instruments when radiation spikes. Calm conditions can change in hours. There have been famous casualties. In 1997, the Telstar 401 communications satellite failed after radiation storms damaged its electronics. In 2003, the Japanese ADEOS-2 Earth observation satellite was lost following a geomagnetic storm. Even military satellites, often the most hardened, have reported unexplained shutdowns later linked to radiation events. Each failure cost hundreds of millions of dollars and served as a stark reminder that the invisible ring is not just a theory, but an active hazard. For every lost mission, others have survived thanks to preparation. The Hubble Space Telescope, for example, crosses the South Atlantic anomaly regularly but was designed with special procedures to pause observations during passes. That forethought is why Hubble still operates decades later. One discovery that sounds almost supernatural is the so-called impenetrable barrier. Observations have shown that the most energetic electrons do not penetrate inward beyond a certain altitude. The cause appears to be natural electromagnetic noise, including Whistler waves from lightning. These waves scatter the most energetic electrons, preventing them from drifting closer to Earth. In effect, natural radio static forms a protective fence around the planet. Some scientists speculate that even human radio transmissions contribute faintly to this barrier, though the main driver is natural. If the belts are so dangerous, why do we put satellites there? Because that is where the useful orbits are. Navigation constellations like GPS occupy medium Earth orbit, right inside the slot region. Communication satellites sit in geostationary orbit, 35,786 kilometers out, where they experience the outer belt's fury during storms. Weather satellites that monitor the globe also use these orbits. To have the services we rely on, we accept the risk of operating in this hostile zone. The belts are unavoidable. Spacecraft armor is therefore essential. 
engineers used layers of aluminum or composite shielding a few millimeters thick to protect critical electronics. Mass is expensive, so not everything can be covered. The brains of the satellite receive the heaviest protection. Solar panels are built from materials such as gallium arsenide, which degrade more slowly under radiation. Wiring harnesses are carefully designed to reduce unwanted charging. Satellites often carry onboard radiation sensors to monitor conditions in real time. Before launch, microchips are tested with particle beams to measure their tolerance. There are also experimental ideas. Some spacecraft use tanks of water or polyethylene as supplemental shielding, since hydrogen-rich materials block protons effectively. Others investigate magnetic or electrostatic shields that could, in theory, deflect charged particles. For now, these remain mostly concepts because building a mini magnetosphere around a spacecraft would require enormous power. But for future Mars missions, these ideas may return. Water shielding, in particular, has a double use. It both protects astronauts and serves as their drinking supply. Operations are just as important as design. Satellite controllers avoid performing delicate tasks during solar storms. They postpone software updates or orbit maneuvers until conditions improve. Imaging instruments are shut down during anomaly crossings. Ground teams follow strict checklists, almost like sailors following rituals for bad weather. These practices may seem overly cautious, but statistics prove they save missions. History gives us a stark warning. In 1962, the United States conducted a high-altitude nuclear test called Starfish Prime. The blast created an artificial radiation belt that encircled Earth and persisted for months. Several satellites failed prematurely. The event proved that the belts could be made worse by human actions. Ever since, such tests have been avoided. Natural radiation is difficult enough without adding artificial hazards. The reason most people never hear about the belts is simple. The effects rarely reach the ground. Our atmosphere blocks the radiation, and the average person notices nothing. Airlines sometimes reroute polar flights during major storms, but daily life continues as usual. The real burden falls on engineers, who treat the belts as constant adversaries. There are teams dedicated entirely to monitoring their behavior, updating models, and advising operators. Scientists studying the belts do not see them as static structures. They describe them in terms of L-shells, pitch angles, diffusion rates, and wave-particle interactions. Instruments detect how lightning strokes below can trigger waves that reach up into space, reshaping the belts. Dedicated missions such as the Van Allen probes have flown directly through them, mapping their behavior in exquisite detail. Sometimes the belt split into more than two layers. Sometimes the outer belt vanishes. The system is dynamic and alive, a kind of weather in space. The challenge is growing. As electronics shrink, each memory bit stores less charge, making it easier to flip. At the same time, we demand more computing power in orbit. The solution is a mix of hardened components, redundancy, and clever error correction. Satellites often carry duplicate systems sometimes even with different chip designs, so that one event cannot disable both at once. It is the space equivalent of diversifying your investments. Evidence of the belt's presence is everywhere, if you know how to look. Whether satellites may show lines of corrupted pixels after anomaly crossings, communication satellites occasionally report brief power dips. Science missions record bursts of noise in their detectors, Navigation satellites sometimes drop measurements that fail quality checks. None of these events reach the average user because ground systems compensate and fill in the gaps. But the fingerprints are always there. A metaphor helps. Earth's magnetic field is like a bodyguard who shields us from the sun. But that bodyguard keeps a dangerous holding cell of prisoners circling the house. If you pass through the cell quickly, you are fine. If you linger, you are in trouble. For human exploration beyond low Earth orbit, 
This is a constant concern. Missions to the Moon or Mars will cross the belts quickly, relying on shielding and speed to limit doses. NASA's Artemis missions and the planned Lunar Gateway Station both include careful trajectory planning to minimize time spent in the most intense regions. For Mars missions, where astronauts will spend months outside Earth's shield, extra radiation strategies, water tanks, storm shelters, and reinforced modules are being designed now. Can we ever switch the belts off? No. They exist because the sun blows particles, and Earth has a magnetic field. But we can learn to live with them. Improved models of wave-particle interactions help predict when the slot region will stay clear. Real-time monitoring allows operators to adapt quickly. Some research even suggests that radio transmissions from Earth might have subtle influences, though this is not a practical method of control. For now, the belts remain permanent. The drama lies in how ordinary the consequences are. Every satellite launch is planned with radiation dose maps. Controllers know where the South Atlantic anomaly lies. They know the solar cycle phase. They consult forecasts before igniting rockets. In the first orbits after launch, satellites measure their new environment carefully. Ground controllers quietly confirm the readings. Thermal looks fine. Power is stable. Radiation is elevated, but within limits. Procedures are followed. It seems routine, but beneath the calm lies a constant negotiation with danger. This is why people sometimes call the belts a ring of death. For electronics, they are lethal. They shorten lifetimes, create unpredictable failures, and force expensive design margins. They are also reminders that space is not empty. It has weather, storms, and tides made of radiation instead of water. To call space harsh is not exaggeration. The belts are one of the main reasons why. Yet they are also part of what protects us. Without Earth's magnetic field, charged particles from the sun would strike the atmosphere directly far more often, stripping it away over geologic time. The belts, the auroras, and the currents circling Earth are all parts of a single magnetic shield. That shield may cause headaches for engineers, but it is the reason we have an atmosphere to breathe. The price of protection is a dangerous ring circling above. If you want to sense the belts in a human way, listen to recordings of plasma waves captured by satellites. When shifted into audible sound, they resemble bird calls or whistles. These are the natural songs of the magnetosphere, the very waves that shape the belts and carve the slot region. You cannot see the ring, but you can hear its music. So next time someone says space is hard, remember why. It is not only the vacuum or the distances. It is because our planet wears a crown of trapped radiation, an invisible ring of death that every mission must endure. Satellites survive through clever design, constant vigilance, and respect for this natural hazard. And every time you use GPS, check the weather, or watch a live broadcast, you're depending on machines that battle that ring daily. Earth's invisible ring may be deadly, but it is also proof of our ability to adapt, to build, and to explore anyway.